largely, um, although there was a, a deathbed, uh, uh, the, 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 the man who was murdered said on his deathbed that it, it wasn't, um, it wasn't mm -hmm. Means or Marshall. And also, another interesting thing about this is the, the chief witness for the prosecution there was Myrtle Poorbear, who is the woman who also was the chief prosecution witness or the, the United States chief witness against Leonard Peltier. You know, this girl seems to get around all over the place and be witnesses at, at murders, you know, everywhere. Like, you know, um, she's a paid FBI informant. She's mentally unstable. Um, Has she admitted to being a paid FBI informant? Well, she, when she was asked at the Marshall trial, she said she couldn't remember whether she was or not. But at, uh, you know, in Leonard's case, there were, at his, at his extradition hearing, mm -hmm. there were two affidavits from Myrtle Poor Bear. And in them both, she says she was there at the shootout. She saw Leonard Peltier murder the FBI agents. Um, at the butler Robido trial this past summer, uh, a third affidavit by the same woman came out about the same incident. Mm -hmm. And she says, and the, actually this is her first affidavit because she has three, one was, this first one was February the 10th, the next one was the 23rd of February, and the last one was um, sometime in March, I can't get the date mm -hmm. there. But um, the one that was, th this one never came out in Leonard's trial. The American authorities deliberately withheld this affidavit because it contradicts the other two. They only produced the other two. The only reason this one ever came out was because it came out in the process of discovery just before the butler Robido trial. How does it contradict? She says in the first one that she wasn't there, that Leonard, she left the area before the shootout. And she saw Leonard two weeks later, and he confessed to her. And the other two, she, you know, makes very graphic descriptions of having been there mm -hmm. at the shootout. And that's what uh, the Canadian government is basing. This is what the American government. Well, and that's their case. Yeah, this is the main. That's what we're using to, yeah. to make our. Yeah, and this findings. same woman is also <clears throat> the the main witness against um, was the main witness against Marshall. Mm -hmm. um, she uh, is quite an interesting character. In one of her accounts of that day, too, she has um, said that the Indians were all riding horses around and around the FBI agents. And uh, she claims that Russell Means and Dennis Banks and Leonard Peltier fathered her two children. She, um, she's mentally unstable. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's a well-known fact, and she will say anything to please whoever she happens to be with at the moment. Leonard, it's interesting enough, he feels sorry for her. He, he, Leonard doesn't know who she is. He, he doesn't recognize her from her pictures. And he says that we have to feel sorry for the poor girl because she's, um, she's not all there, you know. How, how can you make that claim that she's unstable? Well, we have uh, uh, her, her father was willing to testify if at Leonard's appeal that his daughter is uh, um, unstable and that she will say anything to please whoever she happens to be with at the moment. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should get into uh, how it was that Leonard Pelche was charged and who he was charged with and why he was charged and that kind of thing. I think maybe thing. I should just go over briefly, well, as quickly as I can, the um, what happened that day of the so-called murders mm -hmm. in Dakota. Um, these two FBI agents, the people on the reserve were, were phoned by the local law enforcement officer, I guess it's a sheriff there, and told that Kohler and Williams, who were well-known FBI thugs, were on the reserve and that there was going to be trouble. Mm -hmm. Now the sheriff warned the Indian people, you know, and um, there was, uh, there were people um, camped near this jumping bull hall down there. And Kohler and Williams walked into that encampment from different sides, 
firing automatic weapons. Mm -hmm. They shot at a 12-year-old boy who ran up the hill. They shot just at his feet, you know, <coughs> making him jump up the hill. And the the men and you know the men who were near nearby when they heard the shooting uh, down there, it's an armed camp. I mean, everybody has you know the Indians have hunting rifles or whatever in their houses to protect themselves because it is just a state of war mm -hmm. on that reserve. And uh, the men came out and defended the people who were being attacked. At the, the two men who were charged, or there were four men charged originally. <clears throat> the FBI brought in something like 300 agents and they kept saying, oh, they had clues, they were close to picking up people. But they got, they had nothing. They, had, they couldn't get, find anything. So they went to Dick Wilson, this um, corrupt chief that was there at the time. Mm -hmm. he, had a list of uh, he had a list of people who he called undesirables, members of the American mm -hmm. Indian Movement that he didn't want on his reserve. And the FBI has t took out 20 John Doe warrants. That's a warrant where you just fill in the name. Mm -hmm. And they took the first four names off Dick Wilson's undesirables list. Leonard Paltier, Jimmy Eagle, uh, Bobby Rabideau, and Dino Butler. And that's how they were charged. The other 16 warrants are still outstanding. I mean, anybody could be charged with those mm -hmm. same two murders, you know, quote, murders. Um, Can I ask you how you found that out? I've, uh, I've talked to people who were there. Mm -hmm. I've talked to Leonard. I've talked to Leonard's wife. Um, you know, I, I've talked to, to people from down there who, who were there, who know what happened, who know what was going mm -hmm. on down What there. does Kelly have to say about that? Well, the butler Robido trial, I was just going to mention that the two, Leonard's two co-accused, they were acquitted, and Clarence Kelly of the FBI, the director of the FBI, testified at their trial. He was subpoenaed by the defense, mm -hmm. and he said that um, uh, people, he, he admitted under oath that people have the right to defend themselves and their families. And the, the acquittal was based on the grounds of insufficient evidence. The state didn't present uh, enough evidence. Mm -hmm. But the jury made it very clear in their decision that even if the government had made a better case, they would have still found them not guilty by reason of self-defense. They mm -hmm. were defending themselves and their families. I think there was some contradicted evidence at that trial that it was the FBI who started firing, too. Yes, it was, it was, it was um, proven at that trial mm -hmm. that it was indeed these two FBI agents who came into that encampment firing automatic weapons. The house that was standing nearby was just, it was just completely torn apart. I mean, they use weapons down <coughs> there, um, you know, tremendous modern weapons. The guns these two men had tore holes in the building, you know, holes like that. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just, uh, you know, they didn't just have handguns or anything. Like, people say, why would two men go in and attack an encampment like that? You know, are they nuts or what? But they have superior weapons, and they didn't think anybody would shoot back, you know? I think they made the same mistake that Custer made, you know? Thought they were un attacking an unarmed group of uh, old people and children. Mm -hmm. And, uh, which is where Draper comes in. He, his testimony was brought up at that trial, too, regarding Anna May Aquash, No, Draper's testimony else? was that Myrtle Poor Bear wasn't there at the shootout. And, he's, and uh, he's a, he was a paid informer, and he was testifying for the prosecution right. in the um, butler Robido trial. But his testimony was that he, he was shown pictures of Myrtle Poor Bear, and he said, no, she wasn't there. Mm -hmm. Now, we attempted to bring that out at Leonard's appeal hearing, this new evidence, the third affidavit, the, the Draper testimony, um, um, Poor Bear's father willing to mm -hmm. testify, and uh, that evidence, we weren't allowed to bring in new evidence at the appeal. What makes uh, people think or the people in your organization think that Leonard is going to be murdered before he gets to court in the United States? Well, um, we have affidavits from people in the States. We have these affidavits from uh, Leroy Casadas. Mm -hmm. um, this was taken in Iowa. 
and a Carmen Sanchez. They were in a, in a house that was raided by the FBI because the FBI thought Leonard Peltier was in this house. Mm -hmm. And they grabbed Leo, Leroy Casadas and they said, kill him, it's Peltier. The others yelled, don't move or I'll kill you. Raise your hands or I'll kill you. They threw him against the wall. They got everybody else out of the room. They kept the gun against my head. One agent then noticed that I didn't have a tattoo on my right arm as Leonard Peltier has, and he said, don't shoot, it's not Peltier. But in these affidavits, these people swear that uh, the FBI made these statements, and when they left, they said, if we ever run into Peltier, we'll kill him, or we'll throw him in jail with such a high bail that he'll rot in jail. Mm -hmm. And the thing that, you know, I think is so deadly is that they're so determined to have him, you know? Like, their case has always been the weakest case they've had of the four has been against Leonard. Um, Dino Butler and Bobby Robido were acquitted. The charges against Jimmy Eagle were dropped. And yet, they have such a weak case against Leonard, and yet they're so determined to get him back. And they know, they must know, that they can't possibly prove in court a case against him. And we believe they just want to get him back, just to get their hands on him. Butler and Robido, as I understand it, even admitted that they were shooting. They were there and they were shooting at yes, the time. Yes, Butler and Robido always, uh, you know, Confessed. admitted that they were there. <laughs> and yeah. uh, they were defending right. women and children and old people. Well, we don't have very much time left, so uh, maybe you can tell us I, um, about it, the way he's being yeah. held. <laughs> I don't know what kind of a case I presented here. I. I, there's so many, there's so yeah, much to it, it's quite a long involved thing, but um, we believe that Canada opened its doors to the draft resistors, the Vietnam War, because that was a racist, um, unfair war. There's a war going on in the States between the Indian people, especially at Pine Ridge, and we believe Canada should open their doors to people who are fleeing that war. Mm -hmm. We want to. We want people to send telegrams to Ron Basford, urging him to not to sign the extradition papers because it's in his power to keep my brother here in this country to keep him alive. I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to get into the conditions under which Leonard's being held, but uh, that's another story. <laughs> So, but thank you for coming, and I, I hope we've uh, helped to explain a little bit more, anyhow, more than the media has at large. So, uh, thank you. Thanks. The media at large is another. <laughs> I know. Too. I know. Indian Affairs was produced and hosted by Nita Ditchfield. Today's guest was Donna Tyndall. Donna's mother adopted Leonard Peltier, one of the American Indian movement leaders who is now being held for 11 months in Ocala prison awaiting extradition. Donna Tyndall's mother, Ethel Pearson, is still in Ottawa where on Wednesday she met with Federal Justice Minister Ron Basford. Donna is a member of the Quaggiel Nation in Duncan and a member of the American Indian movement.